peaceful liberation, or violent conquest. Each story in history has at least two sides, and the annexation of Tibet by the People's Republic of China in 1950 is no different. For the Chinese government, it was the liberation and reclamation of rightfully owned territory, but for the Tibetan people and many Western countries, it was an invasion and an occupation of an independent nation. I'm your host David, and this week we are going to look at the events surrounding the Chinese annexation of Tibet. This is The Cold War. A successful day is one where I have learned something new, which is why I am so pleased to be working with the sponsor of today's video, Magellan TV. Magellan TV offers documentaries on a wide range of topics, and even arranges them into thematic playlists to make learning a topic even easier. The Great Commanders playlist has six documentaries on some of the greatest military leaders in history, from Alexander the Great to Horatio Nelson to Georgi Zhukov so you can learn more about how they impacted the history of the world. And don't feel like you have to be tied to Earth, either. The space section on Magellan TV has hours of videos to choose from. And the good news is Magellan TV has even more than that. There are more than 3,000 documentaries waiting for you, and hundreds of them are on the history of various periods, from the ancient world all the way to the modern era. New documentaries are added weekly and available on most devices, including phones and PCs. Magellan TV has a kind and exclusive offer for our viewers. Click on the link in the description and get a one month free trial and watch hundreds of history documentaries anytime, anywhere. So we'll start with a bit of background. Like many conflicts that occurred during the Cold War, the China-Tibet conflict has its roots in a time before the two superpowers were playing nuclear-backed chess with the world. In 1911, Chinese revolutionaries led by Sun Yat-sen overthrew the last imperial dynasty of China, the Qing, and on January 1, 1912, they proclaimed the creation of the Republic of China. The newly founded state claimed inheritance and control over all the lands that belonged to the Qing Empire, a claim that was backed by the abdication edict issued by the Empress Dowager Long Yu, which called for the continued territorial integrity of the lands of the five races, into one republic which, as you might have guessed, included Tibet. Tibet itself had been part of the Qing Empire since 1720. However, the 13th Dalai Lama, wanting a free Tibet, decided to proclaim its independence in 1913 after rejecting Chinese promises of restoring his title. Its ambiguous independence, or at least autonomous status, was somewhat reinforced by the Simla Convention in 1914, which initially agreed to by Tibet, China, and Great Britain as the treaty defining the borders between Tibet and British India. According to the convention, China had suzerainty over Tibet, but not sovereignty. Lhasa was free to govern itself however it wished. Of course, the representatives of the Republic of China, considering Tibet an integral part of the Republic, immediately repudiated the terms and therefore never actually signed the treaty. But Tibet had a treaty signed between itself and Great Britain, demonstrating independence on the world stage, right? Now, while some of the eastern provinces of Tibet remained under Kuomintang and warlord control, the ROC couldn't make a move to force Tibet into submission as it was preoccupied with more pressing matters like civil strife, a Japanese invasion, and then a full-on civil war. And so Tibet's de facto independent status continued until 1951. Now, in the aftermath of the Chinese Civil War, and with Mao Zedong and the Communist Party emerging triumphant, Tibet's freedom began to come under question. Just like the Kuomintang, the CCP considered these lands rightfully Chinese, and Beijing was determined to incorporate them into the People's Republic, either peacefully or by force. And force was certainly an option, as standing at 5 million men strong, well equipped with Soviet arms, and battle hardened after years of fighting, the People's Liberation Army was more than capable of achieving Mao's goal of subjugating Tibet. On the other hand, Tibet was totally unprepared for a conflict with such an opponent. Its army was small, ill-equipped, and poorly trained, the results of the last two decades where any attempts at modernization and expansion of the Tibetan military had been throttled by influential aristocrats and priests 
the men who basically ran Tibet's almost feudal society. In addition, during this time, Tibet had chosen diplomatic isolation and had made few connections with foreign powers, powers that could have been called on to help protect it against an external threat. In November of 1949, Tibet made a last-ditch effort to gain diplomatic support from the UK and the United States, and in a letter addressed to Mao Zedong, it even warned the Chinese that the Tibetans were determined to protect their de facto independence. An attempt was made to hastily train and equip Tibetan troops with modern gear, but it was too little, too late. With Indian and British intervention, a diplomatic solution was also explored, and the Tibetan ambassadors, failing to travel to Hong Kong, finally met with the Chinese mission in early September of 1950 in New Delhi to begin negotiations. Not surprisingly, each side reiterated its position, the Tibetans stating their independence, while the Chinese issued a three-point demand to the Lhasa mission. The three points called for Tibet to accept itself as being part of China, to allow Chinese troops to care for its defense, and to let Beijing handle Tibet's foreign and trade relations. Fearing a Chinese invasion, the Tibetan mission in New Delhi telegraphed Lhasa that they should make some concessions to the Chinese demands in order to maintain a level of autonomy, specifically looking for the right to use Tibetan troops to defend their land and to be able to trade independently with neighboring Nepal and India. The government in Lhasa was, however, unwilling to make any such decision and told the ambassadors to stall the negotiations as much as possible in the hope of receiving international support. Yet, despite their attempts, the world situation did not improve. It was clear that Tibet would not receive much, if any, help from other powers, and the Chinese grew ever more and more impatient with every passing day. Finally, on the 5th of October, tired of waiting for an answer from Lhasa, the Chinese military crossed five points of the upper stretches of the Yangtze, known at that point as the Jinsha River, and entered Tibet with the aim of completely surrounding the Tibetan army base at Chamdo. This would give Beijing the upper hand in the ongoing negotiations, and would more or less force the Tibetan government to accept the Chinese demands. At Dengo, in the northern sector of the invasion area, Tibetan forces managed to hold back the Chinese attack for several days, but a pincer movement by the 15th Regiment, which had crossed the river further upstream, exposed the Tibetan flank and forced the commander, Mucha, and his forces to retreat back to Chamdo. Not stopping to fight, the 154th Regiment continued to march day and night towards Riwoche, reaching their objective on the 15th. In the central sector, the crossing Chinese forces at Gamto Druga were met with heavy Tibetan resistance and suffered heavy casualties as a result, but Chinese numerical superiority forced the small defending force of 200 Tibetans to fall back. With the PLA troops successfully crossing the Yangtze at Gamto Druga, the defending Tibetan forces at Jomda, only a day's march from Gamto Druga, and serving as the regional headquarters, withdrew towards Kyushung. Kyushung was a natural defensive position, and the Tibetan soldiers would have a large advantage against the invaders. They greatly underestimated the speed of the Chinese, however, who managed to catch up to them on the same night. Caught completely by surprise, the Tibetan forces offered only a token of resistance before being shattered and fleeing. In the southern sector of the attack, the Chinese were even more successful. On the 7th of the month, the 157th Regiment of the PLA crossed the Yangtze and made their way towards Markham, easily overrunning any Tibetan outposts on the way and forcing the demoralized commander of the Tarkan Regiment, defending the area, to surrender his entire force of 400 soldiers. The Chinese went on to occupy the towns of Po and Pasho, effectively cutting off the southern escape route. The situation was worsened due to chaos in communications and the indecision of both military and government officials. Lhasa, for example, was only informed of the invasion on the morning of the 12th, and Ngapo, the commander of the Tibetan force in Chamdo, in fear of being blamed for abandoning Ham to its fate, refused to withdraw his troops despite the pleas of lower-ranking officers. He did so only after the central government ordered him to do so on the 17th, but by that time, it was already too late. While marching, their retreating forces were only met with further bad news, 
as a messenger from Riwoche informed them that the Chinese had taken the town almost without fighting. The danger of Tibetan troops being completely encircled was now more than real, and a race to the crossroads at Langong Ngamda began. It was a race that, unbeknownst to Ngapo, the Chinese had already won, as after capturing Riwoche, a small detachment continued marching to Langong Ngamda at full speed. When Ngapo's scouts returned to him with the grim news, the decision was made to surrender instead of trying to break out, and they temporarily stopped at the Drugugong Monastery. While staying there, Commander Mucha and his 400 troops arrived, but this didn't change the situation as Tibetan officers considered their force inadequate to wrestle control of Langong from the Chinese, even temporarily. Thus, Ngapo sent a delegation to the PLA to formally surrender his army. On the 19th, the battle for Ham was finally over. After the destruction of the Tibetan army, Chinese troops moved to occupy a series of towns, which they did while meeting virtually no resistance, but they refrained from marching to Lhasa. While they could have easily done so, the Chinese side of the story was one of peaceful liberation, and so they played this part by waiting for the Tibetans to come back to the negotiating table. With little choice left, Lhasa, on the 21st, instructed the members of the mission currently in New Delhi to meet with the Chinese immediately in order to discuss the three-point terms, albeit with some modifications. Lhasa was willing to accept the first term, that Tibet be considered part of China, but only if the Chinese would guarantee the title and authority of the Dalai Lama, and if the Tibetan government would still function in the same independent manner as it had for so many years. The Tibetan government also wanted to retain control of its foreign and trade relations, and the right to have its own troops. Yet, as the Tibetan mission was getting ready to meet with the Chinese, another telegram arrived reversing the decision regarding point one. The acceptance of the first Chinese demand had divided the government in Lhasa, and many deeply opposed it. So, in order to reach a conclusion, the Tibetan officials had turned to the highest authority they could, an authority that surpassed even the Dalai Lama himself, the gods. Through a divination ceremony where the gods were consulted about Tibet's future, it was decided that acceptance of the first point would only bring misfortune, so they immediately informed the delegation in Delhi to not accept the Chinese demands. The divination ceremony also dictated that full power should be transferred from the regent Takra, who was currently ruling Tibet, to the Dalai Lama. With no choice left, as the gods willed it, the old regent resigned, and on the 17th of November, the 14th Dalai Lama assumed full authority. The Dalai Lama's ascension was a very important step for the faction that wanted to defend Tibet's independence until the last man, and now they would play their last card to do so, an appeal to the United Nations. On the 7th of November, Tsepon Shagapa, a senior Tibetan diplomat, forwarded from Kalimpong the Tibetan appeal to the UN. The Secretary General received it on the 13th, but technicalities, like Tibet not being a member of the United Nations, and the message being sent from India instead of Lhasa, prevented Tibet's case from being put on the Security Council's agenda until a member state requested it. Lhasa, through Shakapa, asked Britain, Canada, and the United States to support its appeal, but instead they received support from an unlikely source, El Salvador, which on the 14th asked for the invasion of Tibet to be added as an item to the General Assembly. Yet the appeal never passed through the committee. Britain, India, and the United States were hesitant to support Tibet's appeal. India played perhaps the most important role in this diplomatic game of chess, and after exchanging some heated correspondence with the PRC, they came very close to openly supporting Tibet's case, but a final Chinese letter promising trade rights in Tibet turned India's position on the matter. As for Britain and the US, due to their distant geographical position, they were inclined to follow India's lead, whatever that may have been. So, despite the British Foreign Relations Office having determined that Tibet was indeed a separate state, and its appeal to the UN was therefore legitimate, the British, who considered India to be primarily responsible for Tibet, followed suit. Needless to say, this betrayal shocked pro-Western circles on the Tibetan political scene. Other countries also followed India's line, and so Tibet's first appeal to the United Nations had failed. 
Tibet had no choice but to return to the negotiating table. In the meantime, secret plans were made to move the Dalai Lama to a border town near India so as to have an easier escape route to India in the event the PLA marched towards Lhasa. For their part, the Chinese remained fully committed to their propaganda and refrained from advancing. They reiterated their position that this was a liberation campaign and no social or political structure in Tibet would change under CCP rule. In their attempt to peacefully conclude the annexation of Tibet, they found an ally in the face of the captive, Ngapo. He had realized that the best course of action for Tibet against the all-powerful People's Liberation Army was to accept Chinese demands, and even though he didn't have the authority to negotiate on behalf of the Tibetan government, he made an attempt to mediate between Lhasa and Beijing by sending a letter to the former informing them of the PLA's strength and of Chinese promises to respect the authority of the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan government. Tibet, facing no real prospect of diplomatic or military assistance by early January of 1951, despite the United States changing their stance and being more favorably inclined towards helping Lhasa, entered serious negotiations with Beijing. After a round of meetings in Yatung, a Tibetan delegation, including Ngapo, traveled to Beijing in late April to further discuss terms. After a month of talks in which the Chinese held all the cards, the Tibetan mission was more or less forced to accept a 17-point agreement authorizing Chinese rule over Tibet. While this decision divided officials back in Lhasa, and questions were raised whether the government should reject the document and flee into exile, the Dalai Lama, in October, accepted the agreement. In the immediate years following Tibet's annexation, or liberation, whichever term you prefer, the Chinese mostly kept their pre-war promises to respect the unique social and political structure of Tibet. With the exception of the areas of Chamdo that were directly controlled by PLA troops, the rest of the country remained under the control of the Tibetan government, which continued to hold a great deal of autonomy. This period, however, wouldn't last long, as the land reforms instituted by the PRC caused an uproar in eastern Ham, which in 1956 resulted in armed conflict between Tibetan militias and PLA troops. The Tibetan rebellion would change the relationship between the People's Republic and the autonomous region, causing the 17-point agreement to be repudiated and the Dalai Lama to flee into exile. An even grimmer chapter in the history of Tibet was about to begin. We hope you've enjoyed today's episode, and to make sure you don't miss all of our future episodes, please make sure you're subscribed to our channel and have conducted a divination ceremony to obtain the favor of the gods to press our bell button. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of our supporters, and if you aren't a patron, please consider supporting us at www.patreon.com slash the Cold War or through YouTube membership. We can be reached via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com. This is the Cold War Channel, and as we think about the Cold War, I will leave you with the words of JFK. In the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air, we all cherish our children's future, and we are all mortal.